Welcome. I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Before Bradley Cooper could portray composer Leonard Bernstein in his film Maestro, the director and star first had to get the blessing of the music legend's adult children. Mo Rocca got the scoop. It's Cooper's second film as a director. We're far from the shallow now. The first was the hit A Star is Born with Lady Gaga. Still, he needed the consent of the three living Bernsteins to make the movie. He met with firstborn Jamie in a New York restaurant. I eat with my hands all the time, and I'm eating the spinach with my hands, and I recognize it, and then I either apologize for it or something, and you said, that's what my dad used to do. Oh, yeah. Corn on the cob was Mostly his corn. favorite thing. And I remember in that moment, I thought, oh, this might happen. Later in the show, Leonard Bernstein's oldest child, Jamie, reflects on her relationship with her famous father. Jamie, I saw something somewhere where in this house that you used to sort of run into your father sometime in the middle of the night. <laughs> Is that right? Um, yeah, I, we would run into each other all the time in the middle of the night because we were both night owls. Mm -hmm. So around two in the morning, we would run into each other, you know, raiding the refrigerator in the kitchen and would wind up just talking about all kinds of things and eating our snacks. Mm -hmm. So that was lots of fun. That yeah. happened all the time. Then, at the height of Leonard Bernstein's career in the 1950s, poodle skirts were all the rage. The style is just one example of how the skirt evolves with the fashion times. Faith Saley looks at the history and the significance of the versatile garment. They tell us a lot about our culture and our values and how we treat and think of women themselves. While skirts have certainly hemmed women into traditional notions of femininity, they've also dramatically demonstrated the power of the wearer. Textiles were extremely expensive before the Industrial Revolution. The bigger the skirt, the more fabric you needed, the more wealth you were displaying. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. Composer Leonard Bernstein is responsible for some of the most enduring melodies of the 20th century. Bradley Cooper directed and stars in a biopic exploring the maestro's genius, loving marriage, and complex inner life. Here's Mo Rocca. Last summer we had really good grapes. Nina Bernstein-Simmons, Alexander Bernstein, and Jamie Bernstein gathered at their family's Connecticut home to talk about maestro. So how long do we have to do this for? Well, we need to build up a very strong connection. The movie that Bradley Cooper has made about their late parents. And how much time do you all spend in the house now? Or? Every chance we get, you know, weekends and lots summertime. of summertime, and it's heaven here. Much of the movie was filmed in this house, where the children share cherished memories of their father, composer and conductor Leonard Bernstein, and their mother, actress Felicia Montalegre. And if you're wondering how these three feel about the movie Cooper has made... I think we have a, an intruder in this house. Oh, stop it! Bradley Cooper not only co-stars, he also co-wrote the movie and directed it. Oh, too much! Much of this movie was. We shot so much. Many things occurred right, right, here. right here. The creative person uh, sits alone in this gray studio that you see here and writes all by himself and communicates with the world in a very private way. It's Cooper's second film as a director. We're far from the shallow now. The first was the hit A Star is Born with Lady Gaga. Still, he needed the consent of the three living Bernsteins to make the movie. He met with firstborn Jamie in a New York restaurant. I eat with my hands all the time, and I'm eating the spinach with my hands, and I recognize it, and then I either apologize for it or something, and you said, that's what my dad used to do. Oh, yeah. Corn on the cob was Mostly his corn. favorite thing. And I remember in that moment, I thought, oh, this might happen. The young American-born assistant conductor of the Philharmonic Symphony, Leonard Bernstein. Cooper immersed himself in the life of Leonard Bernstein, who from the age of 25 was a bold-faced name in American culture. The longtime conductor of the New York Philharmonic. Today, 
we're going to talk about the meat and potatoes of music, the main course. The man who made classical music approachable through his televised young people's concerts on CBS. And the composer of symphonies and landmark musicals, including West Side Story and Candide. Sopranos make sure that you make space so that the high notes can soar. Becoming Bernstein meant looking like him at various stages, and the transformation is startling. And it took four years, four years of tests. The makeup is amazing. Oh, yeah. If summer doesn't sing in you, then nothing sings in you. You may have read that Cooper's makeup includes a prosthetic nose that the non-Jewish actor used to portray the Jewish Bernstein. The Bernsteins themselves are more than fine with that. I just want to point out that Bradley has a very substantial nose. He does. I don't think anybody noticed that before the fracas happened. It's the absolute non-issue of all time. I'm thinking of a number. <laughs> <laughs> but Maestro is not a womb-to-tomb biopic. Instead, Cooper decided to explore the relationship between Bernstein and his lesser-known wife, portrayed by Carrie Mulligan. Oh, well, I was listening. You were wonderful. Our mom was the most elegant, delicious person. Theirs was a love story, yes, but complicated by the fact that Bernstein also had affairs with men. She didn't go into the marriage blindly. Not at all. She knew exactly what the deal was. They obviously loved each other to death. They never fought in front of us. We never saw any, any dar darkness. We felt a lot. They kept everything very well uh, tidied uh, and pretty well hidden. But as a young woman, Jamie had questions, as depicted in the film. So the rumors aren't true. Her father didn't tell her the truth. No, darling. I know exactly who you are. It's Give it a whirl. In her 2018 memoir, Jamie reported that shortly after their wedding, her mother wrote to her father, quote, I'm willing to accept you as you are without being a martyr and sacrificing myself on the LB altar. And you wrote in your book, but the truth was she had done exactly that. Yeah, I, that's how I feel. I don't, yeah. maybe you don't feel that way, but I feel like it, it cost her everything to, to stick with it. It yeah. was really tough for her, and I think it contributed to her early death, in a way. I wouldn't go that far. Um, I think, you know, probably uh, she regretted a lot of things looking back. Felicia Montealegre died of lung cancer in 1978 at the age of 56. She had a wonderful, rich life. And, uh, and mostly wonderful marriage and a lot of love. There's a price for being in my brother's orbit, you know that. As much as Maestro is a love story about a marriage, it's also a story about Leonard Bernstein's love of music, including Mahler's Second Symphony. I've never experienced anything like it in my life, and I may never again. Were you actually conducting the musicians yes. there? I worked, it took me six and a half years of working on it for six minutes and 25 seconds of music. Leonard Bernstein died from a heart attack in 1990 at the age of 72. He and Bradley Cooper never met. Well, do you miss him? Me. Oh, yeah, man. What do you miss about him? It's hard to talk about. I don't know, we shared something very special. The four of us. It's hard to even articulate. No. But he was with us, he was with me certainly throughout the entire time. His energy 
has somehow found its way to me that I really do feel like I know him. Up next, an exclusive excerpt from Mo Rocca's chat with Bradley Cooper and the Bernsteins, something you can only see right here on CBS News Streaming. Stay with us. And then the final version, when they came over, for me at least, it was, I'll, I'll never forget it, and we all hugged at the end. As promised, here's more from Bradley Cooper and the Bernsteins. When you first met them, did you know the story that you wanted to no. tell? You didn't know. No, I, so I knew nothing. So when you first met with them, what what were you asking? I had just finished A Star Is Born, so they were all. I say, you know, can you see A Star Is Born? And then it really was like, you know, I asked Santa Claus for a baton when I was eight. <laughs> I worked very hard, and uh, I'm going to dive in and trust me. You know, I just didn't lie. I didn't make up something I didn't know because mm -hmm. I didn't know at that point. Uh, but I knew that I was absolutely obsessed with this music and conducting, and I had a huge furnace inside of me for us. I knew it, I just didn't know what it was gonna be, but I was gonna dive in and do research. We didn't even know how big the furnace was. <laughs> we didn't even know. What do, you, what do you mean? Well, when Bradley takes a deep dive, he really goes All the way. many, many fathoms in and down. And I know that uh, Josh Singer, who co-wrote the screenplay, it. said no matter how many books I read, Bradley read more books. No matter how many videos I watched, Bradley watched more videos. <laughs> and now let me ask the three of you, what was happening to your father when he was conducting? What do you think was going on inside of him? Oh, well, you know, he talked about that some. He would just get completely lost in the process. And he often said that he felt like he was channeling the composer, especially when he conducted Mahler. And so he was just so in it that he would lose all sense of place and time and if it was a really intense experience, at the end of the piece, he would be sort of out of his own body and yeah, it would, would take him a minute to sort of come he, back to he Earth. He described it as loss of ego. Loss of ego. Yeah. And, and you know, that moment, uh, his Carnegie debut, I mean, he's talked about, you know, he doesn't remember anything. Right, yeah. You know? He doesn't remember when he, when he filled in for Chris. Yeah, the for, minute um, the downbeat for, began. Yeah, he, and he the next thing he remembers is, is, you know, the applause. Jamie, I saw something somewhere where in this house that you used to sort of run into your father sometime in the middle of the night. <laughs> Is that right? Um, yeah, I, we would run into each other all the time in the middle of the night because we were both night owls. Mm -hmm. So around two in the morning, we would run into each other, you know, raiding the refrigerator in the kitchen and would wind up just talking about all kinds of things and eating our snacks. Mm -hmm. So that was lots of fun. That happened all the time. Yeah, that's very sweet. I mean, did the three of you, I mean, crave more of your father? Because he gave so much, but he gave so much to so many people. Did you feel like there was enough for you? We're well, used a... to sharing him mm. with the world. That's, mm. that's been a given from the get-go. But we got a lot from him. He when was he not- When he was home, he was really, really He was really home. home. When he right. was, what, what did you say about his being he present? He was always present. When he was with you, he really was with you. Mm -hmm. That's where his attention was. And I'm sure there's a lot of people who are in the room, but right. they're somewhere not else. The they're not with you. And so I, for one, am tremendously grateful for what I did get. I'm not greedy enough <laughs> to ask for more. Yeah, I think we all pretty much felt like that. You know, he was on the road all the time. He would be gone for weeks at a time sometimes a month or two. Uh, but then when he was home, he spent so much time with us. We would come out here to Connecticut on the weekends and he was really there, really around, you know, yakking with us, having dinner and playing our word games and swimming in the pool and playing tennis. And so there, there was really a life together that, that was so nourishing that it really made up for the absences. And for the three of you, if there's, one thing more than any other that you think Bradley has in common with your dad, what would it be? Mm. Oh, you know, a lot of things. Lot. <laughs> we didn't even know in the beginning. It, yeah. it gradually occurred to us as this whole journey was taking place. You know, he's actually a lot like our dad. The, uh, the intensity and, and total immersion yeah. in the work. Yeah. That, that's and really... Talk about being present. Really. 
This is the, maybe this the guy. presentest guy yeah. um, you ever met. Totally. So there's that, um, and just and, you know, absolute commitment and absolute focus and perfectionism. That's a lot. And yeah, it is a lot. And artistic genius. Yeah. And for the three of you also, there's one moment that you think will stay with you, or that even just when you were at that screening that was painful, exhilarating, what? That hit you the hardest? What would it be? Oh, come on. It depends which time one? we're can seeing I, Can I talk? Can I yes, ask you didn't ask yeah. me? I don't know if you remember this, but so that we saw many versions. They came over to my yeah. house, uh, a little screening room in the basement, and, and which was beautiful, which I think that they realized, like, it really, you know, to watch this sculpture be made, you have to go in different direction and it's very meaningful you know and depending on what direction it's a different movie and then the final version when they came over for me at least it was I'll, I'll never forget it and we all hugged at the end and and I we were, we were and destroyed and and so oddly enough it, it was the same exact position that in the movie when they're hugging uh, oh their mother. Oh my right. Yeah, it's right. Right. never occurred to me. I didn't yeah. know. And I thought that in that moment when oh like, you know, your, your head was buried oh. here and if you see, you saw the movie, yeah. I assume. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that, that scene where, um, where after uh, the clapping song, mm -hmm. do you remember that moment? Yeah. And then Felicia's cutting his hair and then he brings everybody over. I mean, that, that is what occurred in real life. Up next, the long and short of it. Welcome back. They can be tailored, full, short, long, formal, casual, and so much more. Faith Saley has the story of the humble skirt and how each generation has given the garment new cultural meaning. What do pencils and poodles have in common? Hoops and hobbles? They are skirts, of course. When I say the word skirt, what words come to your mind? How big can it be? <laughs> what length would you like it to be? For designer Christian Siriano, the skirt is a transformative piece of clothing. The options are endless. Mini, midi, maxi, asymmetric, straight, or frothy. The skirt is about being free, having more movement, not being kind of trapped inside something, which I think a pant does, and a skirt is more freeing. That feeling is sewn into the definition of the word skirt, a piece of clothing meant to dangle from the waist and move around the body with few restrictions. I find them more comfortable. They're a canvas for beautiful textiles, which I love. Kimberly Chrisman Campbell is the author of Skirts, and she says as unfettered as they might appear, skirts are tied to some meaningful history. They tell us a lot about our culture and our values and how we treat and think of women themselves. While skirts have certainly hemmed women into traditional notions of femininity, they've also dramatically demonstrated the power of the wearer. Textiles were extremely expensive before the Industrial Revolution. The bigger the skirt, the more fabric you needed, the more wealth you were displaying. Early 20th century skirts gradually became shorter and narrower, especially during World War II when material was rationed. But in 1947, designer Christian Dior repudiated that starkness with an ultra-feminine silhouette called the New Look. While the 1950s poodle skirt was an evolution of that voluminous look, Chrisman Campbell sets the story straight about its popularity. Poodle skirt comes from poodle fabric, uh, which was a sort of hairy, stiff, but lightweight fabric. It was only later after the skirt came into being that designers started decorating them with poodles. And while we're myth-busting, you may be surprised to learn about the origin of the miniskirt. No one thought it was sexy to begin with. When it was introduced in 1964, it was something that looked like you could buy it in the children's department. It had ruffles or it had bows or polka dots. It made women look like little girls playing dress up. So the miniskirt was created for young women who didn't want to look grown up. That's right. The miniskirt addressed that gap in the market dressing women who were young but did not want to look like their mothers. 
For many women, though, the choice to wear a skirt wasn't theirs to make. It was only in the late 1970s that women were allowed to wear pants in many schools and restaurants and workplaces. It wasn't until this year that the U.S. Marine Corps ended its last skirt mandate for women. While the skirt has become a ubiquitous female symbol, men across the world have traditionally shown some leg. Skirts are an extremely masculine garment in many cultures. We think of it as something feminine in the West, but the Scottish kilt, for example, is a garment associated with tough warrior highlanders. And let's not forget Tonga's tupanu, famously flaunted during the Olympics opening ceremony. Tonga! As for American men brave enough to flirt with their hemlines... How did it start with you designing for Billy Porter? Yeah, my Billy moment, which was probably my most famous skirt moment. And he just loved it, and he loved the idea that he could wear something that was like still somewhat classic, which every other woman would be wearing, so why couldn't he wear that? And so the skirt comes full circle. While it once stitched women into traditional roles, it now offers men something to step into to shatter stereotypes. There are no rules, you wear what you wanna wear. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.